But I had the thought this morning of um, faith. The Bible says that we should take the shield of faith to fire off the fiery darts of the enemy. Do you know what the fiery darts of the enemy is? You ever felt them? There's a scripture that said, we're made righteous by the blood of Christ. He who knew no sin became righteous. He became righteous, that, or he became sin, that we might become righteous. Now, do you want to feel a dart? In your spirit, you begin to think, I'm righteous. A little voice says, oh, no, you're not. That's a dart. Or when it comes time to talk to somebody and give them the witness that you're a Christian, you say, well, no, I'm not really. Why not? We can be made righteous in Christ. And that's, that's what's wonderful about the new covenant. But my thought goes, where I want to get started on this, is if you turn in your Bibles to, um, I want you to turn to Deuteronomy. Now, if all goes right, I'm planning on reading that. But it's terrible to stand up here and look at my batteries half low. It's all right. I'm, I won't go in the flesh. I'll try to go in the spirit. Amen? Turn to Deuteronomy. Uh, Israel was a nation that God brought up to, to give us lessons on who he is, who God is, what he's like. And uh, that's why he revealed himself to Israel to, pull him, to put himself in a nation and give an example of who he is and how he works and what he does. He says, Israel, you're a special people now. I want to show my power. I want to show myself strong through you. So he picks one of the strongest nations now, Israel was one of the smallest nations, but he picks Egypt. And he allows Israel to go into bondage down into Egypt, and there God begins to do great miracles and great wonders because he's starting to show himself strong. Now, you that, are be that have become Christians, I want you to hold your hands down until you agree with me and you, you can relate with me that once you became a Christian and you asked Christ to come into your life and you really meant it and you, you experienced the new birth, the Bible says these signs will follow them that believe. Did something spectacular happen when you were first saved that you can look back and see? Can you raise your hands? Well, I'm glad because, you know, God confirms his presence by doing things. It's not by our righteousness, because we found out we don't have it, do we? But we can put on his righteousness. But see, God was working with Israel in a special way, and he, he wants to work through us. But the thing that irritated God was they, that he, they soon forgot what he had done with them. That, that bothered the Lord. Now, in Deuteronomy 6, uh, as God gives these commandments to Moses, he puts out a caution here for the people. And, and we need to learn from this. We need to learn from these cautions here. I need to. It says, and, and then I want to read uh, portions of, if my trifocals will take me there, to Deuteronomy, there'll be six, and Deuteronomy 7, Deuteronomy 8. And it says, now these are the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land whithersoever, whither ye go to possess it. That you might fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee that thou, thy son, and thy son's son all the days of thy life and that thy days may be prolonged. God's saying, I'm going to give you some laws that will help you to live long life. You break these laws and they can 
chart in your life. It's like the laws of the land. They have some laws, lines that says don't pass on this hill. It could be dangerous. I've broken those laws as a young smiley aleck driving. I wasn't a Christian. But I thought, you know, I'm going to take my chance. I'm in a hurry. And I'd follow that wrong side of the line up over the hill and get in quick. I thought, well, I'll have control. I can whip it to the right path. A lot of people have done that and didn't get away with it. But see, we sometimes forget these laws were made for our good. God made these laws for Israel's good. And then that's why we read them, that we might learn who the God of all creation is. He says, I have laws. Hear ye therefore, O Israel, and do and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee in the land that flows with milk and honey. O hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. You know, if we're not careful, we break that one. In being afraid or ashamed to take a stand and witness for the Lord under certain situations, I think, I think we're brought to a test. It might be in a restaurant where we're we think, well, we should bow our heads in prayer and thanksgiving to God for our food, and then we look around and think, well, I don't think these guys are going to like it. Maybe I'll just whisper it, you know. But uh, God says, I want, us, you know, I want you to be proud. I want you to remember me, what I've done. I was thinking of how our country is, now they're going ecstatic because they're, they've found Pluto. They've got up there and they're going to get some new new lessons and learn. And one of the one of the scientists said, well now we're, we're going to think we, we might possibly find some of these planets and things out there that where life began, what where life comes out of these stones and when the earth collided and crashed and boomed that somehow there's one, they're going to find something up there that started all this life. And I think and God comes out in his word and he said he's made things past finding out. He says, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Forget it, God says. There's certain things he's not going to let you know. There's certain things that's in his power that are going to stay in his power. But man, you know, they, they say in the school, well, we don't believe in creation. We don't believe that God created. And they're going to prove their theory. In the meantime, the Bible says the just shall live by faith. Just have faith that God did it and let that be it, folks. And then tell that to your children and let those children tell their children. Pass that on. That's what God wants. He wants us to believe that he is, that he's the invisible God. We don't see him, but he knows he's there. And he's come along after he first became a Christian. He's done things just enough to establish that he's real. Amen. You prayed for that loved one and they were saved. You prayed for God to bring conviction on that one and it happened. Maybe not the way you wanted it, as fast as you wanted it, but you maintained faith and it happened. Might have been a healing. Uh, like finances, like the sister was telling somebody, God provided their finances uh, God just has different ways. And when you instill faith in a child, I was had to break out in my spirit laughing this morning. When we first started out in Christianity, I didn't realize how much faith I was instilling in my children. And I had my two oldest sons. One was, <clears throat> the oldest was about five or six. The other one was two years younger. And they had done some, one of them done something in the house. I don't remember what the incident was, but I wanted to correct them. I wanted to give them their punishment for it. I asked Bob, the oldest one, I said, Bob, did you do that? No, I didn't do it, Dad. I tell you, I didn't do it. I asked Mike. Mike said, I didn't do it. Well, one of them did it. One of them had to do a situation where one of them two did that, and I thought, you know, I'd put the pressure on and I'd get the confession out and they stood there just as strong as can be. Neither one of them did it. 
And all ones that dropped into me, I got a thought. Okay, so I can't punish you, but I said, I'll tell you what. Boys, take my hands. Let's stand in agreement that God will punish the one that did this wrong. My old boy said, oh, no, Dad, Dad, don't pray that way. Don't, don't pray. I thought right away, I thought my spirit caught the guy. He said, I said, why? He said, well, I love my brother Mike, and I don't want to see anything bad happen to him. <laughs> Oh, uh, uh, well, okay, figure that one out. <laughs> but I thought, now these guys, they, they had faith in God, in, in Dad's prayer. But God did answer our prayers. One year, we were hurting financially. And one of my sons, I think he must have been about nine then, he went out the mailbox. We'd been praying because financially we were going through some real hard times. And we had prayer that God would supply these needs that we had. And my one son couldn't wait till he got home from the school bus. He, he'd run quick and open the mailbox. And uh, we found out he was, he said, well, I'm looking to see when, that, when, when the money's coming in for you guys. He just had faith that was coming because we prayed God was going to send our funds. In. God wants this kind of faith as a child to be instilled in us because he's real. We don't know how he's going to do what he's going to do, but he, he was trying to uh, teach Israel this. He says, now Israel, <clears throat> here's the commandments. In verse 4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now he wanted them to hear this because they were going into a land where they had all kinds of idols, all kinds of gods, and they were going to have peer pressure to believe in this because they were uh, small in number. And I don't know if you know what it's like, but to be voted uh, in a minority where everybody else is taking a stand and you're the lesser one and your vote doesn't count and your opinion doesn't count. Well, sometimes in Christianity, this is where you're going to stand. But where to stand? People don't want to hear you. They don't want to hear your opinion. They might laugh at your thought. But hey, if God said it and that's the one you're taking a stand with, believe it. It says in verse 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Now here's where all of these verses you can apply, where it says in Ephesians, that's six, sixth chapter where it goes on, it says, With all take the shield of faith, whereby we may withstand all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And we're all gonna we're all gonna have fiery darts. They're gonna come one way or another. They're gonna come. They're gonna come in one color, one form. And then in Jude or, uh, tells us in Jude twenty four says now unto him. It says that it's able to keep you from falling. The devil says, "Oh, that you no no God can't do that. God can do it. That's a dart. When God's word tells you something." And a little voice tells you the opposite. That little voice is a dart. It can, call, it can get you into trouble. <clears throat> it says he's able to present you faultless. Think of that. Right now as you're sitting right there, God is able to present you faultless in his presence with exceeding joy. Christ is able to do that. Christ presents me that way. You know, we can look at one another and find fault. <laughs> but thank be, thanks be to God that he says he'll, he'll forgive. When, when there's a, a repentant heart in us, this is what God wanted in Israel. He want, Israel, I want you to pay attention to my commandments. Keep the right spirit. Do the right things. And when the time comes, I will deliver you. I'll deliver you from all these enemies. He said, I didn't choose you because you were more in number, just the opposite. But I, want, I chose you because I wanted to prove to you I am God. In verse 6, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. That's where I want them, in your heart. 
today it's it's such a popular thing to uh, for even clergymen just to think we can just all get in a molding pot and we can all just kind of have any type of theological interpretation and it's all going to work out. That isn't so. When I talk to a man that he has his people bow down to a statue in his church, some clergymen don't have a, a, a problem with that. You don't bow down to any other image other than God. God is God. And Israel went, were tested, and it was a real test. Now you think about this for a moment. We'll point our fingers at Israel and make fun of Israel and say shame, shame on Israel. But we're living in a day when there's all kinds of cults and beliefs and borderline Christianity. And they might call a man father when God says, don't call no man father, but your father which is in heaven. Did he say it? I think he meant it. I'm your father. Teach your sons and daughters that to call no man father. I'm your father. That's the only one. And I've heard ministers call other ministers father. Address them as a father. I don't, I, I don't really mean to get picky, and I didn't have intentions of getting into this, but I'm thinking, how can this relate to our day? This is how it relates. Let's take what God says, and, and that's why it's good for us to get together, as it says in Malachi, it's, it tells us there in the fourth chapter about they that thought upon the Lord's name, thought upon his word, they thought upon his word, and spake often one to another, and the Lord heard it, and he wrote it down in the book of his remembrance, and he says, when I make up my jewels, he says, I'll remember you, the thought upon my word, and that remembered my name, and I wasn't afraid to talk about it. And the day that I make up my jewels, you will be there. Isn't that wonderful? He said it. Going on, it says, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as Frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thine house and on thy gate. Now that sounds kind of fanatic, but have you ever done anything like that for the Lord? Come on, you have, sure. I've taken memory verses and gone to work. I've taken Bible verses and gone to work, write the verse on one side, the reference on the other, so I can remember where it was. As I first started out as a Christian, these were... The former years, it tells us in Revelation, he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. Return to your first love. Go back to what you did in the beginning. Go back to when you saw results from your Christian life. And I remember writing things on, uh, on these. I'd have a packet of them. I thought, now, if I can just remember one verse a day, and I, my memory's been bad, folks. And I, I didn't get an A-plus in memory in school, I'll tell you that. I had to write my answers here and there and all this and that when I had tests in the school because my memory wouldn't hold it up. And I got in trouble for even trying to memorize. But I would uh, improvise when I could, but sometimes that didn't work. But God says do it. He says, I want you to write them on the doorpost. If you have a bad memory, write them down someplace. But get them out there and remember what I'm telling you. And I'd find that if I could remember two verses a day at the end of the week, that's 14 Bible verses I've memorized. The Lord says, you're not so dumb and stupid, you can't do that. I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to do it. And I did it. And it helped. And I would, I'd have to go back because I'd forget them if I wasn't careful. And you go back and you bring up these verses. And that's what sustains you. And that's what comes as you grow up. In the Lord, you need to go back to those things lest you forget them. They're promises that are good for us. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. See, God will let me do it. Teachers would swap me for it. And they shall be as frontlets between the, <clears throat> thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thine house, upon the gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God 
to have brought thee into the land which he swore unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give thee the great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which you dig not, vineyards and olive trees which you didn't plant, thou shalt have eaten them and are full, then beware lest you forget the Lord which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to tell you, you keep my laws. I'll bless you. But once you're blessed, don't forget where they come from. See, and this is, this is uh, what we need to instill into our children. There's a breaking away today. I don't, I don't know what's going on. But it just seemed like there's, there is definitely a pulling away from the rules and commandments and the regulations of God on the oncoming generation. When man says, well, we're going we're gonna to see where we came from, they can't accept the fact the Bible says you take God at his word. That's what it's saying. If God says something, take him at his word. The world says, no, we're going to teach in the schools. You don't take God at his word. First of all, let's get rid of this God thing. Let's get rid of this Bible bunch. And let's make them look like fools in the schools. And let's make them look stupid and laugh at them. And uh, if we get this pressure out, we're going to have a generation. We won't have to put up with this religious environment around here. Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, you're living in it. And that's where you have to have faith. The Bible says that uh, your Faith is going to be a shield that will quench these fiery darts. Because when it comes to the end, like the songs we've been singing today, it's the blood of Jesus. It's what Jesus said, and I'm just going to hang in there. And I said, Lord, my prayer was this morning, what should I share with your people? He says, I just want you to encourage them to hang in there, believe in my commandments, Get them in, know my commandments. Now, we're not living in the Old Testament. I realize that. And so let's, let's turn to uh, the, the New Testament. It gives us uh, some uh, new covenant, which we're supposed to have. In Mark 16, it goes on. It tells us in the 16th chapter of Mark, in the last few verses, uh, would someone read me the last... I don't have it right here before me, but read me the last three verses of Mark 16, would you please? Or the last four verses of Mark 16. I want you to participate. The first one that has it, would you stand, please? Mark 16, the last four, okay, in the last four verses. Yes. Isn't that wonderful? The Lord went with them, confirming the word with signs following. You know, you take off. uh, I was in Big Rapids one time, and I hadn't been a Christian very long, but I I had been pastoring, I think I was pastoring at the time, in White Cloud, and uh, I was witnessing on the street at Big Rapids, and there were three gentlemen, young guys there, I think they're from college, and as I was approaching them and talking to them, the Spirit of the Lord came on me, and I, I just tried to let them know that God knows who they are. I said, and you, I said, God knows you. He knows you by name. And I said, you, you could be John, you could be Charles, and you could be Adam. Whatever name I said, they, they looked shocked as I mentioned their names. They said, sir, you might not know it, but you called off correctly each one of our names. I didn't know that. Signs. That was a sign to me. 
That's all it took. I thought, thank you, Lord. His anointing will come upon you in ways that you don't know. You can't, you can't practice it. Some might try it. It doesn't work. But to see miracles happen and signs following, he does it. Just to confirm to you he's with you and he'll bless you because you're taking a step of faith. And, that, and that, I never forgot that. These guys stand there and they just say, I, we can't believe that. I said, well, I just want to let you know. God knows you guys. He loves you. All you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ and repent and be born again and come into his kingdom. And they're standing there wondering, well, maybe he's right, you know. Well, what more do they want? And they're just these little things that happen confirming the word with signs following. Now, as far as this taking up snakes and drinking poison, uh, there are stories behind that, too. I don't want to go down one of those churches down south where they handle rattlesnakes and be stupid. And God didn't mean that. Paul took up a serpent uh, after Jesus had spoken those things. And in a shipwreck, and the serpent latched onto him, and he shook it off, and people were converted because they saw it didn't kill him. Uh, in Vandalia, there was an evangelist preaching there several years back. And I knew the man, and he, he was a man of God, and he, he would really speak under the anointing. But he was telling the story one time that uh, a woman in the church had heard him talk enough about poison that she, believe it or not, took enough rat poison and put in his, invited him out to eat and put enough rat poison in the dish to kill him. But she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check this guy out. I'm going to make sure he's practiced what he preached. And she put that in there. And the story goes that she was surprised. Now, I can't believe a, a believer doing it, but she must have been an agnostic or something, pulling a dirty trick on him. But she, she brought the story to him later, and he told us about it, that this woman actually had put poison to, to try to kill him, to let him know, hey, if you believe what you're preaching. Uh, and he said, uh, that was just one incident where God did a miracle for me. He says, I didn't have any after effects. And she was stunned and had to confess that she did evil. But they're just things like this, but God will confirm his word with signs. For Jesus said, greater things than these shall ye do. He meant it. But with Israel, the Lord was taking them. He says, now, I want you to learn to believe in me, believe in my word. And there's going to be, my word this morning is going to be, folks, we're going to go through some fiery trials. And when, when the people, uh, uh, the scientists and the People of this world are going out there and rejoicing. Hey, if he crumbled the Tower of Babel because they were building, they didn't get anywhere as near to Pluto, and God confounded their languages and brought them down because they were trying to ascend some other way to God or get a tower that reached into heaven somehow. And God said, I'm not putting up with that. Somewhere along the line, he's going to jolt the earth if man gets too proud, too arrogant. But be the place where you can say, hey, this is God. God later on came and proved to Israel in 1948. He kept his word, and they became a nation again. They, they were practically annihilated as a nation. They scattered all over. There was no nation of Israel. That was all history up until 1948. They, for hundreds of years, there was no nation of, no, of Israel. Then Great Britain and some others got together and said, hey, we'd rather have fuss with these Jews. Let's let them have their own nation. Let them go back home. So we're living in the era when Israel was started afresh as prophecy. They'd become a, a nation in the last days. Well, God didn't stop there. Then all the nations turned in and they turned against Israel like they did back in uh, David's day, back in... Uh, the Bible times when they surrounded Israel because they was few, and God had to constantly do miracles and show that he was strong with this little group of people. You don't mess with them. They're my people. They're Israel. God said, I'll bless the nations that bless you, and I'm going to put a curse on those that curses you. 
Well, in the Six-Day War, back in the 60s, the nations got together and said, well, we're going to annihilate the Jews. We're tired of these guys. I don't know. I've never known a Jew that much, as far as I know. I didn't know that they could be so aggravating that people want to annihilate them. I don't know what the country's problem is. But they said, we're going to do this. I know Detroit has a lot of them, different places. They say they're mostly in the, in the movie industry now and, and uh, making up our movies and a lot of the stuff that's going on out there today. A lot of them are very wealthy people. God has still blessed them. But the nations got together and they said, we're going to wipe off Israel and wipe them right into the Mediterranean Sea. I was pastoring in Coleman at the time, and I thought, this is going to be interesting. Because I've been reading the Bible where things just don't happen that way with Israel. I didn't know how it was going to happen. That little country, I thought, wow, let's see what happens here. And I, I followed the news for weeks there as Russia was going to come down. They sent their planes and their tanks. And Jordan had built up their lines with their tanks and their planes. Egypt built up, and they said, okay, now we're going to all get together, and we're going to wipe them, rush them right into the Mediterranean Sea. We're going to annihilate them. <laughs> Israel got wind of it just a day or so ahead of time and said, God gave them wisdom. And they went in, and before the enemy even got his planes off the ground, Israel had destroyed the Egyptian army in hours. Not days, in hours. Only took three days to win the whole war. And I thought, yeah, that's my God. I told the people, I told them, I said, it won't happen. Watch, something's going to happen. But we read the word of God, something's going to happen. He's going to do what he said he's going to do. He will do for you what he said he's going to do. God comes along, I mean, you think of it. When he said, let there be light. There was light. That's a bang theory. Bang, there was light. <laughs> or well, however, when God speaks, it happens. God says, I'll make you righteous. Well, you read the 11th chapter of Hebrews, everything didn't happen just right then, but the people died sometimes, not receiving the promise, but by faith they died believing. might not feel righteous, but you can die believing. God said it. My sins are washed away. I don't see them. My sins lay in here anywhere, but Jesus, and he said, by his blood, I'm, my sins are washed away. And I've seen things drop off little by little. Have you? On your life, have you experienced that? We're just... Oh, I had this habit, I had that. I smoked, I drank, I done this, I done that. Little by little, things would drop off because God spoke. It happened. It works. Not because I, I remember going back to the factories. I give my life to Christ, and I thought, well, I'm going to go back into the factory, and I'll just kind of keep my mouth shut here. I don't want to make a big splash. And, but little by little, the Lord gave me strength not to listen to their dirty jokes, not to talk like they talk, not to walk like they walk. One boss said, you got to work on Sunday. I said, no, I don't work on Sunday. He says, well, you're going to work here on Sunday or you won't have a job. He said, you'll go down the road talking to yourself. I said, oh, no, no, I won't. I'm not going to work on Sunday and I'm not going to talk to myself. He said, we'll see. I said, if I go down the road, I'm going to be talking to the Lord. I'm going to be praising the Lord. And the Lord let me know. Promotion comes from the Lord. God honored when I got fired by giving me a better job. Amen. I got a job in buddy coach. They paid more money and they respected me. When I left there to go to Bible school, they said, he said, one of the bosses said, oh, anything's better than this place. He said, good luck in your Bible study. <laughs> He was for me. He said, and if you need a job, and you need a job when you come back in this area, he says, I'll give you one. God is a good God. Well, let's, let's take him to heart. Let's take his word to heart. 
the Lord says, try me, prove me. One of the greatest tools that you can pass on to your children is give them a Christian testimony that's up to date that God has done something that they can see. Wow, God did this. God does answer prayer. And the Bible says you raise, you raise them in the way they should go. And as they get older, they won't depart. But that means you, you have to discipline yourself and help them to see that when Daddy prays that God will find the wrong one, they have faith that God's going to find the wrong one, <laughs> the, one the guilty one whatever it might be, or God provides money for the family, God provides food, God's going to take care of this country. At times I waver and I think, oh, I hate to see this country going the way it's going. I go back to the Word of God. The Holy Spirit says, go back to Jeremiah. Read Jeremiah. I told him to go to the potter's house. He went to the potter's house. He says, and I'm going to cause you to hear my word. He went to the potter's house and he sat there and he watched and here was this potter had a piece of clay on the spinning table. He was spinning it and shaping it and he was just, God told him to watch him and he says, I'll cause you to hear what I want you to say. And what I want you to tell Israel. And as he was spinning this vase around, his finger caught a pebble that made a mar in this nice vessel. He had this thing almost shaped to perfection and it was marred. And the potter stopped the wheel and took and crushed the clay before his eyes and started all over. And the Lord says, that the Spirit spoke to his heart and says, there's the message. And any nation, is, any nation, he said, and that's concerning Israel too, if it does not shape up the way that I want it to, I'm able, I'm capable of crushing that nation and I'll make it anew, the way I want it. When I start to see things and mires and things and going on and uh, the way at the atmosphere is out there, I think, you know, I'm just going to learn a lesson there. God is able to take care of every situation, not just nations, households, your personal life. One place the Lord says, the Lord has made us. He's, the Lord has made us, not we ourselves. He's able to make me what he wants me to be. When I first started ministry, my, my dad wasn't a preacher. And his dad wasn't a preacher. And I didn't go to church too often, but I went enough. And I had a godly grandmother that I knew there was a God. And I knew the Bible was true because... There was enough influence that I thought, oh, someday I'd like to, I'd like to learn this God. I'd like to, to learn about him. And I found out, and I don't know where I was going with that thought, where I started from, but anyhow, I learned that God is real. When he says he's going to do something, and I got started in the ministry, so I said, go back when there wasn't a, uh, preachers in the family. But when I pastored my first church, I would get up and I'd think, well, how should I be? I hear Billy Graham, and I thought, well, I'd like to be like Billy Graham. And uh, it was the worst version of Billy Graham you could ever think of. I thought, well, Billy Graham was sharp and intelligent. I thought, well, I better be like one in the Bible. So I'd, I'd find Moses. The Bible says Moses was the meekest of all men. Well, I'm going to try to be meek in front of the people. I'm going to try to have a sermon that's meek. Be a meek person. Love everybody, be meek. That was terrible. That didn't work. And I thought, well, Lord, what do I do? I didn't get an answer right away. Well, then I come across, uh, I'd come across Peter in the New Testament. It was bold. The Lord says, well, you need to be bold. You're too, you can't be timid. You've got to be bold with my word. I'll get up there and I'll be bold. That didn't work. And I, I was desperate. This is no joke. This wasn't play. This was humiliating. 
And I'd go home and I'd cry and pray to God, God, what do you want me to be? The Holy Spirit spoke softly to my heart. You're Bruce White. That's all I want you to be. I made you Bruce. There'll never be another one like you. You're the only one. He threw the pattern away. I want you to be yourself and let me work through you. Okay, Lord, here it goes. And that's what you're seeing today. That's, this is it. I'm not Moses. I'm not Pastor Dave. But I'm the best Bruce I know how to be. <laughs> and that's all God wants of you. Be the best you can be and let God work through you. And you'll be surprised. You will see these signs follow you like others testify. I'd hear ministers talk about what God did. One preacher, he, he was so eager to hear from God, and see angels and all this and that. And he was up at the altar one time. No one was in the church and he was praying. He had his fish his fists doubled up in his sockets of his eyes as he was desperately pry, praying. His eyes was filled with tears and as he prayed and prayed, no one was there and he got up and he raised his hands all at once. He thought, I, the minister said, I thought for sure I started to see an angel because he said, I started seeing these little stars. He says, and the Lord revealed, then it was revealed to me, those were the same stars he saw when his brother took his fist out of his eyes. They weren't angels he wanted to see. He would just saw little stars from pushing his fist in his eyeball sockets too hard. And you know, we can get desperate. And God might not answer the way you want it to, but he will answer. He will do signs. And as you get older, it seems like you need more signs. Amen? You need more things to happen. But God promised. You're going to live by faith. It's not going to be by works. It's not going to be by your righteousness. Just watch what he can do. It's awesome. I'm wondering, I, I used to think, boy, it'd be nice. I have an uncle that was in his 70s, and he was a logger. He probably wasn't any taller than I am if he was that tall, but he was a pretty good-sized guy, big hands. And in his 70s, he was loading logs on his truck Haul them out of the woods, wrestle these things around. I thought, Lord, I would sure like to be doing things in my 70s. I would like to be employed. I'd like to be busy. And here I still, I have work, but not logs, thank God. But I've got paint jobs coming. I've got all kinds of little projects keeping me busy. God's opened the door for ministry. This church and different other churches around where God's you get people say, would you fill in? I think, Lord, I'd, whatever I can do for you, I want to do for you. And it's a blessing to just do something for the Lord. Encourage people. And I just want to encourage people to believe in God and keep going. It's going to pay. The Bible says we shall reap if we faint not. We will. We'll, we'll get. God said, faithful as he has promised. He's able to perform what he said he would do. You can get to the place where instead of being afraid of dying, you can be thinking in your spirit, bring it on, Lord. <laughs> I want to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. What's wrong with that? One brother, preacher friend of mine in his latter years asked, at the, his sick bed in the hospital, said, Brother White, come here for a minute. He said, yeah, I used to come and preach to my congregation every now and then. He said, uh, he was in his 70s, and he said, uh, where do you believe that we go when we leave? I think the devil was probably trying to give him some fiery darts of doubt. I said, I believe with the Bible, because some believe that you're going to go to the ground and you're just going to rot in the ground to when, whenever like a rotten tomato, they don't believe that there's an absent from the body is present with the Lord. I said, brother, I believe what the Bible says. Paul said to be absent from the body. When you leave the body, you're present with the Lord. Didn't say you're going to go off into nowhere and float and be there till whenever. He says, well, that's the way I believe. Well, I said, that's what the word of God says. I'm taking God at his word. 
So to be absent from this body, to be present with the Lord, why would we want to fight being absent from the body? I, I don't want to go out here and jump off a bridge and commit suicide. The Bible says that we are to, our bodies are the temples of the Lord and we're to let them speak as oracles for God. And that's what we do in our bodies. We live out the will of God in our bodies. We tell people, we make people miserable. That's part of your job. Get out there and make people miserable. Just be a good Christian and you won't have too many friends. Sometimes. Now, I, I know you don't like that one, but it happens. Oh, yes. But the few you do have, you will gain friends. I, I don't know if I'd mentioned here, here or one of the other churches, but I told people a few years ago, when after I resigned my last church, I ended up working in a van factory in Elkhart. And I had the dart, the little fiery dart. Yeah, you're a Christian. You're, you're a has-been preacher. You're working in the van factory. You're doing murals. And, and uh, what are you doing here? And then every now and then a comment would come. But one day, the foreman, my foreman, my boss, came up to me and he says, I don't know what's happening in this place. One of the guys became converted. I'd been witnessing to him. One of the main artists became a born-again Christian, and he wanted an art lesson. I gave him one, and he went down to one of the missionary churches and gave his first chalk talk sermon. And people started to see the change in his life. And through the change in his life, six others gave their lives to Christ in that factory. And my boss said one day, he says, the the supply men that brought the lacquer thinner and materials in to the paint shop to drop them off, they said when they walked in the door, there was an environment there that felt like a church. They said, what's happened in this place? <laughs> I thought, praise the Lord. God can change environments. Amen. If you don't like the environment, change it. With the help of God. Let God do it. Change it. Someone said we're thermostats, not thermometers. We set the temperature. We set it. And let's set it. And that's what God wanted Israel. God wanted Israel to set the example, set the pace, set it in the home, set the standard. You go to the wall, you set it. And that's what God wants us to do. Praise the Lord. Shall we stand?